The largest algae bloom on record is taking place off our coastlines. Here, scientists last... say a massive bloom of toxic algae is growing, stretching some 200 miles from Santa Barbara. The lives Barbara. of sea life are being threatened by a toxic algae bloom growing off the coast of California. Today, headlines around the world warn the public about the effects of massive blooms of toxic phytoplankton. Known as harmful algal blooms, or HABs for short, these events pose threats to sea life and humans alike. Scientists worldwide are working to identify the causes of these blooms with the hope of preventing future outbreaks. At Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, a group of dedicated biologists are working together to discover why HABs occur and what people can do about them. I met with Dr. Holly Bowers of the research facility who introduced me to her team and their various projects. My name is Holly Bowers and I have the Environmental Biotechnology Lab here at Moss Landing Marine Labs. And the goal of our lab is to look at phytoplankton, all kinds of things. So the genetics, the morphology, we're really interested in the species that are out in the bay. Some of them are harmful algal bloom species and those cause problems when they get into high concentrations and they can produce high amounts of toxin and that gets into the food web. So you kind of have the good algae and the bad algae. So that's the bad algae. The good stuff, we actually want some phytoplankton out there because they produce a lot of the oxygen that we breathe. And they're also the basis of the food web. So we wouldn't have the higher mammals or anything like that without the, the base of the food web. So we're interested though in, in these really the harmful algal bloom species and why they bloom and sort of the succession of species throughout a bloom and tying that back into what we're doing on land or as humans living here. There's also natural processes that happen and, and so you can have harmful species that are around as part of the, of the background phytoplankton, but why do some of them bloom? So some of the projects that we have going on, one is we are part of something called Cal Map, and that is one of about seven stations along the California coast. And the idea is we all go out on a Wednesday and we sample and we get a snapshot of what's going on along the coast. And so my student, Hannah McGrath, is helping to run that program right now. And that's important so that we can follow trends. So we can, it can not only alert us when a species might be blooming, but it can also tell us what's happening year to year to year and see if things are starting to become more of a problem. We did a phytoplankton net tow. I dropped my phytoplankton net tow down five meters into the water column. And we pulled it up one meter per second at a time so things didn't fall out. And afterwards, I put it in the plastic containers so we could take them back to the lab and analyze them under the microscope. The other equipment that we use down at the wharf is called a Van Doren, and it's a cylinder water sample that can go down at different depths, and it collects whole water samples, so we can pour that sample into a bucket or whatever vessel you need to analyze the water back at the lab. Back at the lab, Hannah performs various tests to determine how much plankton is present in her seawater sample. She begins by filtering some of her sample to measure chlorophyll. Next, she performs a cell count. After this, some water sample is set aside to check for pigment. Finally, it's time to look at her sample under the microscope. The sample shows an abundance of eucampia. Good news today, these chain-like diatoms are known to be non-toxic and therefore not considered a HAB species. Other projects that we have going on include the genetics of these phytoplankton and so you can look at them under the scope but some of them you can't tell apart from each other so if you look at their genetics we have a handheld qpcr machine and that allows us to dig in really to the trends of what's going on but on a genetic level and also detect things that we might not see under a microscope because there's not enough of them one of our other newer projects is we wonder how microplastics might affect phytoplankton in terms of growth and also toxicity. So our colleague Ross Clark here with the Coastal Wetlands Group, he does bioreactor experiments on farmlands to try to reduce the nutrients that are going into the bay. 
that can fuel these blooms. Some of the reasons we're really interested in uh, wetland research and wetland restoration is that these wetlands play a really important role in protecting the, the offshore uh, marine environment. There are the kidneys that filter all the pollutants and all, um, all the activities that we as uh, humans do on land, and they keep those pollutants from getting into the marine environment and causing um, impacts offshore, including um, algal blooms or um, specifically harmful algal blooms, which can cause toxicity um, in marine life, fish, um, seals, and birds. So um, our restoration of wetlands is helping keep those um, pollutants from getting into the ocean and, um, and harming our marine life. Also, there are microplastics from those farming practices. And so our student, Olivia Pollock, she's looking at microplastics in terms of how those might affect the growth of algae. She had a, an intern, an RU intern this summer, Carissa Tinney, and she helped with some of the setup. You can take that sample from Monterey Bay and basically take a single cell, which is crazy, pick it, and then put it in the, into these culture tubes. They're easily accessible to us for experiments. And that is our incubator. <laughs> Hi, my name is Carissa. I'm a student at California State University, Sacramento. I'm studying uh, biochemistry and I'm here at Moss Landing Marine Labs this summer, working under Olivia as her intern, looking at one of the species of phytoplankton and conventional microplastics and how they uh, affect the phytoplankton. I'm part of the CSUMB, uh, California State University, Monterey Bay um, REU program, which is a research experience for undergraduates. It's funded through the National Science Foundation and it's been great working here. I'm looking at how agricultural microplastics impact the growth on phytoplankton. Here we have a rocking experiment and this is one of my preliminary experiments. In here, these big pieces of plastic, they are weathered pieces of PE mulch. I collected these pieces of plastic off of strawberry fields. That includes all the pesticides, all the fertilizers, whatever they put out onto these fields. And then for my main experiment in here, I'll be bubbling four different types of phytoplankton. So I'm doing two HAB species, harmful algal bloom species, and then two non-HAB species. I'm gonna be taking cell counts, I'm gonna be doing chlorophyll concentrations, and just you know taking photos and observing what happens to these phytoplankton over a span of, say, a week or a week and a half. And then one of our other projects, again with Ross, is looking at the source nutrients from the agricultural water, and if that's enough to fuel a phytoplankton bloom and we're trying to replicate that in the lab. What we can do in the lab here is replicate what might be going into the bay. We can grow a large amount of algae to work on. And what we do is we put in a seawater base, and we put in the media, and we spike in our cells. We can support various projects with this. So most recently, we were supporting a project here at our aquaculture facility where they were feeding Pseudonychia to mussels and then feeding to crabs to see if they would actually eat the mussels. We've also used this to set up a series of nine bags in which we are testing the effects of agricultural waters from local sources as the nutrient base for the algae to grow on. Say a 10% dilution of agricultural water into 90% seawater and see how they, they re respond to that. So we can measure toxicity, we can do metrics of growth like cell counts, also looking at chlorophyll and physiological health of the cells. So that's what we're, we're working with Ross on and his goal is to reduce the amount of nitrogen that's going into. So we're testing the water before it goes through his bioreactors and also after it comes out of the bioreactors. And that's important because obviously we want less nutrients going into the bay so that you're not stimulating these harmful algal blooms. Mm -hmm.